Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait a few more seconds for everyone else to log in. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, I'm Arnika Dawkins, Chair of the APAT Education Committee, presenter of APAT Talks. APAT Talks brings together prominent curators, artists, collectors, and writers to discuss thought-provoking ideas, new trends, and unique processes involved in the medium of photography. APAT Talks starts conversations that lead to understanding, inspiration, and action. On behalf of the members of APAT, welcome to today's talk in collaboration with Aperture. The talk today, object lesson on, influence, on the influence of Richard Benson. I wanna introduce you to our panelists who are Miko Magente, who has been designing art books since 1993. She founded and directs her own graphic design firm in Brooklyn as a principal designer. Magente has worked with a range of artists, museums, and publishers on publications and exhibitions, including the Art Institute of Chicago, Yale University Art Gallery, Asia Society of the Asia Society, the Studio Museum, and Whitney Museum of American Art. She is a lecturer at MIT, Cambridge, where she teaches book design. Also, Sarah Meister, Executive Director of Aperture, following more than 25 years at the Museum of Modern Art where she curated numerous exhibitions, including Photo Clubismo, Brazilian Modernist Photography, 1946 to 1964, Dorothea Lange, Words and Pictures and Making Space, Women Artists in Post-War Abstraction, and Meister's newest initiative is the Aperture Photo Book Club, a series of virtual conversations that consider the photo book as a platform for contemporary creative expression. Sarah Stolfer is CEO and Artistic Director at Tilt Institute, formerly Philadelphia Photo Arts Center. Her photographs were published in the monograph, The Regulars. She is a lecturer at the Stuart Weitzman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania, and Lois Connor, a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship, New York State Council on the Arts Fellowship, and National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Publications of her work include China, Beijing, Contemporary, and Imperial, I'm sorry, Beijing, Contemporary, and Imperial, and Lotus Leaves. Connor has held teaching positions at Yale School of Art, Princeton University, and Sarah Lawrence College. We look forward to an exciting and informative talk with our distinguished speakers. Feel free to engage with them by utilizing the chat box. We'll have a Q&A at the end of the discussion. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you so much, Arnica. It's really a, a pleasure. For, I'll speak on behalf of all of us uh, to be here. I'm just going to introduce uh, very briefly uh, this distinguished panel. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm Sarah Meister, Executive Director of Aperture. And it's a particular thrill for me to be introducing this book, which is, although it was in the works for long before I joined Aperture, was something that I actually was able to be present as it was coming into being. So um, we would particularly like to thank from Aperture's perspective, the individuals, the many individuals who made this book possible, um, not only all of the contributors, uh, several of whom are represented here, the book's editor, Leslie Martin, who is traveling today, which is why I get the uh, privilege of representing Aperture, um, to Miko, and to the wonderful funders who actually make so much of Aperture's work possible. So specifically, our trustees, Elizabeth Kahana, Dawood Bay, Kate Cordson and Kathy Kaplan were all instrumental in this, and a handful of other individuals outside of Aperture's orbit, including Minnie Cushing Coleman, the Doran Family Foundation, Jeff Hirsch, Carol LeWitt, Suzanne Helmuth, Jock Reynolds, and the White Cedar Fund. Um, as this might suggest, a book of this undertaking, although reasonably modest in scale is, uh, is a massive one that really takes a village. So um, 
I love the way that Miko and Leslie describe this as a, a visually centered reimagining of a festrift. So the idea of how we can think of honoring uh, Richard Benson and his legacy uh, together today through this book and through these conversations. Um, the book will be coming out in June. So um, this is kind of a sneak preview for APAD audiences. And it's something that we at Aperture are very proud to have um, helped bring in to the world. So um, Miko, I think what we'll do is let you take it away. And then at the end, I will um, chime in with questions from the Q&A or from the chat. And oh, hello from Anguilla. Yes, please do tell us where you're tuning in from, because that's one of my favorite things about Zoom is thinking about people from all over the world um, who can listen and be with us today. So Miko, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to read first the, the description about uh, Richard Benson from, from the description so that it's like part of the recording. Um, Richard Benson's name is synonymous with the evolving history and philosophy of photographic reproduction, from making platinum prints for Paul Strand and books with Lee Friedlander to his own experiments with inkjet and digital offset processes, and as a teacher and dean of the Yale School of Art, by the time of his death in 2017, Benson had inspired over three decades of students and artists through his mentorship and work. So we're super excited to have two artists here with us today, Lois and Sarah. Um, I think you've been introduced in your formal sense, but maybe Lois, if you just wanna introduce yourself informally here. Yeah, that I wasn't quite sure what you wanted me to say. I'm, I'm a <laughs> photographer, yeah. also a portrait photographer. I teach photography. I've been teaching since 1977. I really enjoy it. It's a really important aspect of my, my life. And, um, you know, I'm so happy to be here to be part of this. So, I mean, Thank I don't you. know how elaborate you yeah. to be. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Thank you. And, and Sarah Stolpa. Hi, I'm Sarah Stolfa. I'm the founding CEO and artistic director at Tilt Institute. Uh, as Sarah said, we were formerly known as the Philadelphia Photo Art Center. Um, we are a resource uh, for practicing photographers and multimedia art artists that are working in image-based practices. Uh, we provide education, exhibitions, programs, and residencies, and much, much more. Um, I'm an artist myself, uh, and a mother, and an educator, and I'm really happy to be here, so thank you. Thank you so much. So we're gonna do a little visual and, and discussion, and we're gonna start out with the book. Um, I am going to switch around my microphone and camera a little bit. Um, and I think, there we go. I don't know if we can pin it. Spotlight for everyone, I'm gonna spotlight it. Okay, so. Um, feel free to, to speak up Lois and, and Sarah at any point, but I'm just quickly going to show you the book. Um, so this is Object Lessons. We have some advanced copies before the book comes out in June. Um, it has this interesting binding. This book was designed by Rebecca Silvers in my office, and um, Eleanor Morgan also helped work on it. So we have quite a lot of wonderful contributors to the book, including the two here today. Um, I'm just going to thumb through a little bit so that you can get a taste of what, what the book will be when you get it in your hands. These are some of the contributors, artworks, commentary, um, some images of books that Richard Benson worked on. And here, Lois, in this part, I thought you might want to just sort of um, mention something about the Peter McGill and Barbara Benson um, conversation. So the back of the book are, are conversations with important collaborators and thinkers and some writing by Richard himself. So yeah, this is the Peter McGill and Barbara Benson discussion. Switch back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, yeah, Lois, was there, I think that we had talked a little bit about the Barbara and Peter McGill discussion in the book, and I think you had some reflections on it as yeah, well. Yeah, no, I just, um, I wanted to say a few things. I, you know, just about the book in general, you know, how when I got it, Leslie sent it um, more than a week ago, and I was, you know, I was really looking forward to seeing it. I'd seen like a draft of it at um, Sarah's show, and, um, but I wasn't expecting to be so moved by it. And I, I think I almost immediately um, broke down into tears. Um, you know, I, I mean, I thought I knew Richard, but learning about Richard from so many different people shows, you know, how he influenced them. It's just, it's different from my experience. It overlaps with my experience, but it mm -hmm. made him like even, loom larger than life you know and yeah. and then when i got to i mean it's i'm, I'm gonna reread um most of them because they're just it's just riveting and then when i got to barbara's um, conversation with peter mcgill it was just the floodgates open it's it's very moving she talks about um uh, you know somebody asked her at, at richard's funeral um uh if she knew many of the people and um, and, uh, and she said, yeah, a lot of Richard's students were there, and um, and I guess they then they asked her if she knew all of them, and she said yes, each and every one of them. That and you know she she sort of explained how we had all been up to the house and and become like part of the family, and some of us had revisited time and time again, and were very connected to the family. And, and, and then it just sort of reminded me that um, when later when I was teaching there, Richard um, asked if um, his son, Daniel, could come and stay with me once a week in New York while I was working for Nicholas Calloway. And, and so there's this long, you know, extension and it just, you know, it's, it's a very moving book. I, I like every bit of it. So, yeah. I don't know if that's no. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm going to screen share now um, from our slides to continue our discussion. Okay, here they are. Um, I got to show the book this morning to, um, to my students here at MIT. So here they are looking at the contributions by Sarah and by Lois in the book. And we got to talk about the finding and we got to talk about the format. And it's just a pleasure to sort of pass it on to the next generation, which I think is something a book can really um, let us do. Um, okay, so next I thought we would talk with Sarah a little bit about the, the exhibition at Tilt and I have two slides from that. And I'll put the first one up and, and Sarah, if you wanna talk about the, the show. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Um, so I was a student of Richard Benson's uh, during my uh, graduate studies at Yale from 2006 and 2008. Um, after leaving Yale, um, I returned to Philadelphia, uh, where I had lived for quite a few times before going there. Um, and part of my intention of moving here was to start um, the organization Tilt, um, because photographers in the region didn't have access and really at the pinnacle of it was having access to resources to make their work, right? So I was part of the generation that learned on analog as well as digital practices, but there was nowhere support supporting that. And during mm -hmm. my time at Yale, um, Richard uh, was very, um, he made it so that we got printers for the department that was just used for, for the photography photographers studying there and that was a really big deal and so coming to back to Philadelphia to open the organization um, one of our very early supporters um, and is a advisory council co-chair is Peter Barbary uh, the curator of photographs at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and so we've had I've had a close relationship uh, with Peter um, uh, since the founding of the organization and in a conversation he shared with me, knowing that I was one of Richard's students, and I'll just clarify that it's, I struggle to say Richard because many people know him as Chip. So if I say Chip, right. that's who I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, so um, when he let me know that the museum was acquiring um, uh, a, a pledge of prints 
um, for the collection of, of chips and that he was putting an exhibition together, um, you know, I believe the first, you know, uh, large uh, retrospective of Richard's work as a photography artist um, got me thinking and I was very excited that Chip's work was coming here um, and just started to think about all that Chip was as a mentor and a practitioner and um, an educator and thinking about how glorious the exhibition at the PMA was celebrating him as an artist and if Tilt could somehow put an exhibition together that spoke about his other love, which was um, as a teacher and mentor. Mm -hmm. And so this idea um, came together about doing an exhibition, a parallel exhibition at Tilt uh, during the PMA show that would highlight the work of some of his students. Um, that morphed into a conversation about it being a book. So um, really thinking about um, how um, pictures on a wall may not, you know, really connect to or be able to illustrate how someone is influenced by Chip. Thinking about how words really need to be incorporated by that because the visual reference of someone's work may not show that. It may be more in the artist's practice or the way they think about themselves as an artist, their influence yeah. from Chip. Um, and then also thinking about it being a lasting, um, a lasting thing that people that didn't have the opportunity to learn from Chip could learn about his thoughts about the medium and his practice. Um, so that's when Tilt and Aperture started working together, thinking about, um, you know, Leslie spearheading the book and me thinking about um, other collaborating artists and how to translate that into um, an exhibition. If you want to move to the another slide, um, that would be great. And so what was really wonderful about the exhibition at Tilt is that you got to see a huge range of practices and um, of ways of making work, but then also uh, the actual work themselves from unique prints to um, inkjet prints to silver gelatin prints. We even included a portion, an area where there was a reading room um, to see books that, that um, either Chip had worked on or artists had produced with um, influence or guidance from Chip. Um, and the really wonderful part of it is that we got to um, take a selection, a few sentences from each of the collaborating collaborators that are in the book mm -hmm. um, as wall text for the exhibition. So to kind of take, um, distill the essays into um, a few short takeaways, I guess you would say. Um, and it was just a really beautiful way of um, reflecting upon like the lesson learned with the image that you're looking at. And the other thing that was really beautiful about it is that, um, you know, they are just different things. Exhibitions and books are different things. And photography has always used both mediums as a way of, of, of displaying, communicating and sharing the work. So mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was really wonderful to be able to collaborate and have those two things um, together. Um, That's great. Thank yeah, you. I, I love seeing um, seeing these slides in the in the first slide. You could see Lois's work in the in the exhibition over yeah. here on the on the right, which I'm taking note of. Yeah, um, and I just want to say the other thing is, even though the book and the exhibition, like there was collaboration and working, there, it's not a one to one uh, translation, right? Um, so the exhibition itself. Uh, really highlights the visual artist um, and not all of them um, because we have a limited amount of space. Um, whereas the book has a more expansive um, collaborators, including um, educators, curators, collectors, and other people that had uh, printers that had worked with Chip. Um, so there were different translations of some of the same material. Um, so Sarah, I wanted to turn to a couple of slides of your of your own artwork mm -hmm. and uh, maybe have you talk about about yourself as an artist and the influence of Richard Benson and but also your own thinking of, of your own practice. So yeah, we go to the first of a pair of slides, I think. 
Yeah, the first two, the two images are works that I made before going to Yale. Um, uh -huh. Before my illustrious career in the arts, I was had an illustrious career as a bartender um, at one of the oldest bars in Philadelphia. And um, I would take my camera to work with me and I started photographing um, the regulars that came into this bar that I had worked at. At, when I started this work, I'd probably worked there for about eight to nine years. And so um, I was very interested in um, isolating the figure and really thinking about this person who is in the midst of this crazy bar and wanting, there's like a dual duality of wanting to be um, accepted and in a communal space but at the same time um, being very aware of um, how they're holding themselves because they're in the space by themselves. Um, so this, you know, one of the things I think about and I won't, you know, we talk a little bit more later is, you know, one of the things that when I was making this work, I didn't really completely understand what I was doing at the beginning of it and reflect up upon it as I moved through. Um, but one thing I learned, especially at Yale and especially in um, conversations with Chip was um, not separating my art practice from my life practice. And um, I really, life practice, that sounds silly, but from my life. And so <laughs> I take, I take, um, I take interest and in photographic interest in the things that are are me, that are around me, that are part of my everyday life. Um, I wasn't as, keenly aware of that at this point in my artist career. Um, but I always draw influence from what's close and around me. Mm -hmm. So this is the second of the two photo of the two photos I have here from, from the bar. Yeah. Um, and then I also have here the photo that this is uh, Sarah's contribution along with her text in the book. Um, so I thought maybe you could speak a little bit about this photo. Yeah, so this was a, uh, an image that I made while I was studying in, in New Haven. Um, and at the time, um, um, I had, actually this is after a conversation with um, Dawood Bey, who came, who's uh, one of his students, Jen Davis, and I were the same class. And so um, we met him for coffee and he would talk about, sometimes if you're in a rut, you just make a little rule for yourself, um, like a little photographic rule to kind of change about how you're thinking about making up an, Im an image. And leading up to this picture and some before it, I was still taking very formal um, portraits. Um, and so i made a rule for myself. All of a sudden I couldn't photograph, if I was photographing a human figure, they couldn't they had to be doing something. And that little tiny rule that I made for myself all of a sudden changed the way in which I was making pictures and looking at the world. And so um, one of the reasons why I put this picture in um, kind of re refers to what uh, not many people have said in their text and the title of the exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where Richard would always say, the world is smarter than you. And um, I always talk, took that to be um, the world is so beautiful and mysterious in its own way that I can never create something that would replicate it. And so drawing my lessons and learning photography by engaging with the world, um, I never would have thought up this photograph in my head. Um, I found it and I made it and I didn't know really what I had until I saw the, the scan because I was shooting film. Um, so it made me really think about how this, for me, and I think for a lot of us who are practitioners, that it's a continuous, it's a long-term process, and it's a conversation between me and my work, and I, you can't figure it out without doing it. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank I you. Think now, I think we'll, we'll move to um, Lois's photo from, from the book also, and as Lois, I was hoping you would talk about this, and then we have a, a second and related work, but not from the book also on the slides. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I started off with more of a classical shape, like the 5.7 and the 8.10, and after I left Yale, I started using a panoramic shape, and um, I think that we take for granted that 
um, seen looking at the world and photography, they seem connected, but they, and they are, but when you start looking for a frame, you change how you look at that thing you're in front of you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so um, during the pandemic, after using a panoramic camera forever, and I still use it, um, I started thinking about, um, well, I had already been thinking about the circle and how a lens describes a circle and the oval and how they don't have a beginning and they don't have an end. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, your eye is just continually moving. And so it gave me a, a different form to sort of look in this case at New York and I've been photographing in New York since I moved to New York in 1971 and um, it, it really sort of made me change the way I looked I mean I, it's, it's it's hard to say I mean that's hopefully yeah. the photograph um, shows that let me just see you know I always get nervous about all this um, so it was almost like, you know, of course, this, the, the oval itself is, is, you know, it's been around in photography for a long time, not necessarily people photographing with the oval, but putting an oval around a shape around the portrait to sort of make you focus more on, on the person. And, um, well, the circle's been around for a long time, uh, you know, it, it I guess as a nod to um, uh, painting, um, we put the rectangle in the middle of the circle um, to make it more like art. <laughs> um, but I, I, I love the shape and, you know, I feel like I'm just beginning, but during the whole pandemic, I, you know, I went to the street and it was a very strange time because there were no cars. Mm -hmm few people and so it was like being in the 19th century but there you are in the 21st century and um I don't know you know I'm always vacillating between you know thinking about what it was like what it is now and this this strangeness this is the apple store on fifth avenue and let me let me show the next slide because it's the oval but now it's a vertical oval yeah I mean, I should have probably shown a circle, but anyway, I, I, you know, the, I started, um, you know, I went down to Pennsylvania for um, six weeks um, and in the begin middle of March, because I didn't know whether the world was ending. I didn't know what was happening. And then I started, you know, I said, well, I, I need to start this because I'm here and I'm a landscape photographer. So I thought it was natural to start with a landscape and to try to sort of deal with what's going on in the world through mm -hmm. photography. Mm -hmm. And um, so I made this, this series of, you know, I always go back to the landscape and I always go back to trees. And um, when I recently had this show at um, Penumbra, um, they did this, this beautiful book, which you can't see because now you're not seeing me. Oh. <laughs> Here, wait, I'm gonna stop the show so you can, you can show it. But um, so that you could, they made this, um, even though the show wasn't these pictures, they decided to do a book of these photographs. And so you have the, the um, ovals opening up like this and the circles, you know, folding down like that. So anyway. I mean, it's, I can't wait to see it in real life. <laughs> it's exciting to have, you know, the work printed so soon after the time you made it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it pushes you forward because, you know, I've done this. How can I push it further? Do it, you know, continue? Um, but, you know, they're portraits, portraits of trees. Beautiful. Um, so, Okay, so at this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. And so Sarah talked a little bit already about that she was an artist before she met Richard Benson and a little bit about the influence um, he had on, on her work. And Lois, I think that I also wanted to ask you the same thing about you as an artist before you met Richard and how you met Richard. And then I also have some visuals um, from, from then, but I'll, I'll put them up after you start talking. So. Um, well, I, 
I mean, just to backtrack a little bit, I moved to New York in 71. I started working at the UN almost immediately. And while I was doing my undergraduate studies, I was still at the UN. I worked at the UN at um, um, night and went to school during the day. And, um, and then after those two years at Pratt, I went back to working in the day. But I contend, you know, I, I was at that point a photographer and I mean, I don't know what, whether I went around saying, oh, I'm an artist, but I, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. And I, you know, my day job was at the UN. The UN was an amazing place. I made a lot of portraits. Um, when I applied to Yale, actually, I applied with, with portraits, not landscapes. And um, so in, in 1977, the Museum of Modern Art um, put up an exhibition of Tina Madotti's work. And I was just to, so taken by the platinum prints. I'd started making platinum prints in 1974 when I was an undergraduate at Pratt. And, uh, you know, nobody was really making um, platinum prints at that time. I, th I think that Penn started at about the same time, Irving Penn. But I didn't know of him, and, or I would have sought him out too. But anyway, I, um, I saw these incredible prints and I wrote, um, I, found out from the Museum of Modern Art, Richard's address, wrote him a letter and um, he invited me to come up. And um, he said, come up, bring a, bring a bunch of prints. Let's look at prints. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can channel him very easily. And, and so uh, I went up there and he was working on the Paul Strand platinum prints. And, and part of um, the, his studio was kind of outside on plein air. You know, so I guess they could breathe. I don't know whether they're actually exposing in the in the sunlight. They may have been, um, you know, in my romantic remembrance, I, I think they were. Um, but anyway, he was very busy. So both Jock Surges and um, um, Sal Lopes um, took me around and I looked at their work. They looked at my work. And then at the end of the day, um, Richard and I and Barbara had dinner and um, she was nine months pregnant, but they welcomed me as one of the family. It was quite incredible. I stayed at their house and uh, that night we traded prints. I mean, I, I had just met Richard and he was so open, so generous. And it was just, I mean, it was electric for me because I didn't really have anybody to show work to mm -hmm. in that way. I mean, I could show it to my colleagues at the UN and they would, say it was beautiful or whatever, but that's not really, I needed somebody that kind of understood and I was making platinum prints. And I think immediately he asked me, well, who's making your ferric oxalate? And I said, well, that's a little bit of a problem. And he said, you know, he gave me the name of this retired chemist and I started getting my ferric oxalate from him. <laughs> it's too technical, right? <laughs> no, that's amazing. No, I think this audience, I think they can handle the technical. And plus, it's such a huge part of the story for you as a teacher and and with him, your your friendship with him. And so, and then amazing. and then in um um two years later, I I you know I I realized from that meeting with Richard that I really needed a community. I mean, Pratt, there were not very many many of us. Mm -hmm. um, studying and I kept in touch with the few people that were in my class, but I really needed like, you know, a deeper kind of connection to, to photography. Yeah. And so I applied at Yale, to Yale and um, miraculously I got in. And then I walk in the first day and, and there's Richard and doing the orientation. Richard, I'm gonna show you just, uh, <laughs> You know, this portrait by Lee Friedlander, it's basically what he looked like when he when I saw him at Yale. But when I when I met him, he was he didn't have a beard. So I thought, oh, my God, he looks like Abraham Lincoln <laughs> and, <laughs> because I'm obsessed with Abraham Lincoln, like like Sarah um, Stolfa. So um, anyway, that was it was just so amazing to to be there, to see Richard to be a part of that. So I was, in the beginning, I was his, um, you know, he was my mentor, my friend. Um, I became a student. And in 1991, I was his colleague for 10 years. And, you know, so my, uh, you know, I, the multifaceted and I'm probably, not, you know, he continued to be my mentor and he continued to be my friend, even when I was his student. 
yeah. and he was he was very supportive as is um, a student when I was a student. I mean, you know, even though we knew each other before, um, he didn't hesitate to be critical. And uh, um, I remember at one point, um, one crit I showed um, silver prints instead of my usual contact eight by ten prints, and he said, um, "Lois." I don't think you should show those anymore. And, um, you know, because at the time he was um, um, working on the Ache books, he was doing the Lincoln, he did the Lincoln book 79. So I was there 79 to 81. And um, and he was starting to work on the Ache books. So he um, was very much a believer in the contact print at that point. Mm -hmm. so I really hated his advice. I went back and looked at the silver prints; they're pretty good. But I'm I'm glad I continued in the way that I did. I think it was, it was smart on his part. That I was completely broken <laughs> at, at the at the end of the crit. So I have um I have the slides I think from the exchange you made right. um, with Richard when you met him. Right. Like right from right in the very beginning. I'm going to share that. Um, oops. I'm not quite doing that right. Sharing the screen again. So maybe you can talk a little bit about these two prints. Okay, maybe show the other one too. So oh, the other one, okay. So this is the, actually we traded two prints. We traded one print portrait and one landscape each. Okay. And, um, this is from an eight by 10 camera and uh, a platinum palladium print and um, I mean, even this early on, that that early meeting with Richard, he sort of he looked at my print and he was very complimentary. He thought it was a good print, and um, you know, he asked me a lot of technical questions. But he also immediately kind of gave me some advice um, about using more palladium. Now, palladium is warmer, but it's also richer, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 there's something about the warm tone that's like warm, um, not not so much brown as purple brown, um, uh, you know. And you can show the other one, the picture of mine. So we both chose these from, uh, uh, you know, we I had a pile of prints. He said, bring a pile of prints, so I did. And um, you know, throughout the time I knew Richard, even till the very end, he said, you know, I really like that picture. I get it out and look at it every now and then. So, I mean, I'm, you know, showing it here and thinking that he looked at it and he thought it was still an interesting picture, just is very touching to me. So I'm very happy. When you sent this to me, I spent some time looking at it and thinking about it too. So I think um, I, can, I can definitely see that it would have that recurrent, that recurrent interest. Um, and I, I feel the same way when I look at his photograph, I mean, you know, it's like having, you know, I have many of Richard's photographs and, and I have many photographs that he made of other people's work. And, um, you know, because when he was working on the Lincoln book, anyway, I'll talk about that later, but, you know, it's like having a piece of the rock, you know, I can, I can learn a lot just from looking at this photograph even now. Yeah. And the way he was looking at it and and, you know, the way that it's printed, the way that it's, you know, the complete thing. And um, so I feel very fortunate. Uh, he's still a, you know, he will always be a big influence in my life. Yeah. When I walk in every day, I look at the picture of, of Richard by Lee Friedlander. And um, thank you. Unless you want me to say more, I mean, I feel like I'm going on too much. We'll be no, not at all. Sarah, do you want do you want to um, say anything else here about about the your relationship with Richard or and as a, as a teacher or um, sort of you know jumping off of what Lois is talking about too? Yeah, I was just thinking about um, when Lois was talking about process and print, and so you know we were at a time when um, digital was just starting to be accepted within the discipline and thinking about resources. And I remember <clears throat> Richard um, thought some of us were nuts. I'm pretty sure I was one of them because we were shooting film and then scanning it and then making inkjet prints. And we were, he would encourage us that this is a brand new horizon for the discipline. This is a whole new thing that, to explore and find out. And here we are, these young artists like tied to um, film. And um, he was right. Um, I, you know, I really, you know, I think that it, it presents 
digital presents a whole different set of problems, a whole different way of exploring. And getting out of school during that time and coming to Philadelphia to create Tilt, really realizing that <clears throat> resources to make work was such an important thing. And you know, not everyone can have a 64 inch wide inkjet printer in their home um, or maintain it. And so you know, thinking about that access to technology to make your work um, definitely influenced um, my thought process in terms of founding the organization, as well as, you know, my, um, I don't photograph like I did um, before starting the organization, but I don't feel like I'm any less of an artist. And I also don't feel like I feel like my work at Tilt, my artistic work at Tilt and the educational work at Tilt and my role in it is my artistic practice of this point in my life. And that it, when talking to Richard, really thinking about how you had to do something that fed your artist self. And so doing something that, you know, yes, you have to have a day job um, or if you have to have a day job, like have it be something that feeds you and so and feeds you artistically and so my work on a day-to-day -day basis does that and so i i do think about that a lot in terms of um just having a space and lois you talked about it and a community about having a space within your day-to-day -day life where you can make work and be creative and be in conversation with others about the thing we're all so spend so much time in thinking about um, has been really influential in my um, in my in my day to day work. Thank you both for these these like very nuanced and beautiful answers. Of um, I just wanted to say that when I was an undergraduate at Yale, Lois was uh, teaching photography, and I had two really close friends, John Corum and Hillary Grant, who talked about her every day um, in like every conversation about like what she was like as a teacher and what she was talking about about printing. And so I know that you know she has been a really influential teacher. Working on this book um, was fascinating. I was in graduate school in graphic design. Um, when Richard Benson was the dean. And I remember using the HP printer in his office to print something for the School of Art. I had to print multiples. I had to spend the whole night on the floor of his office like while it printed, So because I, I had to change the roll over and make sure it didn't run out of ink and everything. Um, but working on this book was really amazing for me as a book designer and someone who's really interested in printing um, to hear all these stories about the transition from the more like all the photographic processes that were still in use when I started doing books at Abrams uh, to the all computer and his like interest in the computer and comfort in the computer with the computer, um, things about Photoshop. I mean, the Madonna that when he worked on the Madonna sex book with Thomas Palmer, I did like a special conversation with Thomas because I was so excited about how that book was made and I wanted to hear all about it. Um, so I thought that we would end, end this portion of the before the Q and A with a little talk about one of the book projects, but specifically the face of Lincoln, because also you both have this unusual connection, which we learned about this week um, with this project and with Lincoln. So let me share the screen again. So here's the face of Lincoln book, which Lois already mentioned, but Lois, do you wanna say anything else about uh, this project or and your and also you and Sarah, your connection <laughs> here with Lincoln. Well, can you go to the next frame? Yeah. Well, when I was, you know, 1979, Richard was working on this book, and I was at Yale, and um, and so he would, of course, come in with stories every week, and you know, was, uh, Richard was a great storyteller. And, um, and, you know, it's okay that he talk about process because you, you had nobody more riveted than me. And, you know, he, and I love Lincoln and, and, you know, I mean, I have, you know, Lincoln, I've just studied every <laughs> Lincoln, what he looks like, you know, the very young man to the, you know, to, to, to the portrait of him right before he passed away, which is this one. It's like one of the saddest portraits on the, on the planet. And, um, 
anyway, so Rich, and then, you know, when he was working on that project, he gave me this, you know, he would, he would bring in things and I'd be like, oh my God, that's so amazing. And um, anyway, you can switch back to that. I won't. <laughs> those. Um, so, you know, I've, I've read a lot about Lincoln having his birthday um, since a very young age. And, and, and I, so I'm fascinated on every bit, but Richard came in and in this photograph, um, he said there were a couple of photographs that were, they're all glass plates. The ones that aren't daguerreotypes are glass plates. I mean, they're printed pictures too, but there are a lot of glass plates and um, many of them are broken. And um, in some cases they had, this one had all the pieces. And so his, 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 he loved to solve problems. And so he thought about how he could print it. So most of the cracks disappeared. So he put it um, next to printing out paper and a small printing frame. And he put that frame on a phonograph um, uh, that turned for those of you know, that still know what that is. <laughs> and um, so, and then it's outside in the sunlight. And so the sun is going into all the cracks. So you only really see the, the line across his chest, all the other cracks disappear. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you can really look at the portrait. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's so fascinating. He said he went down to the Library of Congress to look at, you know, what they had. And they had like a little pile of pieces and, and he said, well, can I take these and put them in an enlarger? And I think maybe they had an enlarger there. And um, one of them was him giving the, um, his second um, inaugural address and nobody had seen it before because they had, you know, because things can, you know, get lost from their context, you know, because they had such an extensive um, collection of Lincoln photographs. I just was looking the other day at what they had. Um, Sarah, you may want to look. <laughs> we can go together. <laughs> um, okay, just to highlight, Lois has shares a birthday with with Lincoln, and Sarah also, I believe, <laughs> shares a birthday. Yeah. Again, which is like, yeah, no, I, I was just gonna say, you know, <clears throat> um, I didn't know who Richard Benson was when I went to Yale. Um, I I didn't go seek him out. Um, and so I felt really lucky. I feel like this a lot in my life. I felt really lucky that I stumbled across, um, that, you know, he was there when I was there. And I remember, um, I was also born on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Um, and actually I have a portrait of Lincoln tattooed on me. Um, and so, uh, Rich, I don't know how it came up, but somehow Rich and I were talking about tattoos and then that went into Lincoln. And that's when I first learned about this book. And so as soon as I got, you know, we were done with that conversation, I ran back to my apartment, found a copy and got the book. And so um, the fact that Lois and I are on this panel and we both have um, shared birthdays with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, my obsession started with my birthday, but also I'm, I was born and raised in Illinois, which is the land of Lincoln. And then I just became very, um, obsessed with his portrait. Um, and he's one of the most, he, it, you know, he was the first president that was photographed um, at, to this capacity. And I just feel, and when I look at these pictures and the old formal pictures, it reminds me of my bar photographs um, mm -hmm. with the really like bright foreground and then the dark background. And so it feels like these weird little cross sections and these little things that kind of add up for me, at least somehow add up to something bigger. Um, yeah. And so learning about this book and um, the icon of Lincoln's portrait um, and that connection and conversation with Chip was something that always like influenced me. And so I can't help but think about Chip quite often because we have Lincoln paraphernalia all over our home and, and photographs. And um, I knew before he was born that my first son was, I decided I was gonna name him Lincoln. Um, so that connection to family is also something that I learned from Chip. And so that's why in my introduction, I, I mentioned that I was a mother um, because it's a very important um, part of my life and sharing 
the photographic medium, I talk about it in the book. If we're going to bring it back to the book. Yeah. One of the things is that is really influenced is that there's no separation of like home life, work life and art practice life. They're all mixed together. And so um, it's been a, a very refreshing and wholesome way for me to think about myself as an artist. Um, I don't think mothers are always very supported in the art world um, or parents in general. So it really embracing that, that part of me um, and also sharing it with my children. Um, so they go to Tilt. I talk about it in my essay, but like they slept next to the printers, you know, they, they <laughs> went to openings. They, I have pictures of them pulling up, you know, Joel Sternfeld's American Prospects, both of them sitting on the floor flipping through. And, and now they're starting to take their own pictures. So um, it's, a, it's just been a really lovely thing for us all to like connect on. And it's these small little moments that like add up. I mean, like when you when it was said that Lois and I were going to be on the panel, I was like, we share the same birthday. Like, I know <laughs> no one knows that, but we do. That's <laughs> so great. Um, so Sarah, I think you're gonna you're gonna yeah. You know, ask it's some funny. Questions, it's, some questions. Yeah. The well, I, I actually maybe I'll start before I get to the questions. Although everyone, please do put your questions in the Q and A or the chat. Um, just hearing Sarah Stolfa say that, so Sarah Stolfa and I share a first name, <laughs> but we we also share, I was struck, Sarah, when I heard you speak about, before I had even read your contribution to the book, but when I heard you speak about um, what Richard had taught you and your, um, the way in which you said, not separating your art from your life, um, coincidentally or perhaps not, that was exactly what I contributed to the book as well. So in a very, for me, it wasn't this, I, I don't make art, I'm not an artist, but as a curator, I, when I was working at MoMA, I had the privilege of working with Richard on his exhibition, The Printed Picture. And in that, in the book, that book begins with cave paintings. And of course, my um, and when we were realizing that we couldn't bring cave paintings into oh nice idea thanks oh, I know. Um, when we were realizing that we couldn't bring cave paintings into the museum Richard looked at me and he said well you have kids um, why don't you make some handprints that would represent uh, cave printing in the exhibition and I thought to myself you know, it was the first time I had ever even acknowledged that I was a mother at work. And yet somehow Richard knew not only that I was a mother, but that like my kids were the age in which dipping their hands in paint and sticking them on things was a, you know, deeply satisfying thing. And then if you turn the page one more, uh, Miko, please. Um, the, we included in the exhibition, it was the first picture in the exhibition were these little handprints and my kids, we brought their class, their nursery school class in and they were so proud to be on the wall. And it was really the first time I ever felt like I could acknowledge my life outside of my work in my work. And I will be forever uh, grateful to Richard for this because on this same wall, we had examples of, um, of his brother's, calligraphy of his, I think it was his great, great aunt's letter writing of, and even his wedding photo with Barbara that she was so mad that her parents made her take at Bach Rock. This idea of the seamless way in which he integrated his life into this project um, felt like such an important and transformative uh, moment for me. So um, that's, that's part of why I was so happy to be um, here at Aperture as this book was coming, coming into being and to, to realize that it was, you know, it wasn't just me, obviously, it was um, the community of people who Richard uh, really helped them understand their life, their art, their work uh, in different ways. Um, I agree, Lois, I, I found, I find this book very, very um, moving. So, um, that's a very nice, so one, one comment is curators are enhancers of art. That's a, that's a generous way of putting it. We, uh, we try to be, <laughs> um, but Richard, with Richard's help, uh, he really, he thought a lot about, for instance, even in this exhibition, he knew from the very start that some of these 
some of the nuances that he was talking about and some of the nuances that he was interested in in the history of printed pictures needed to be enlarged to be understood. So he made these great enlargements and he we just stuck them directly to the walls of the museum. And he understood that the scale had to be the same in order, you know, he just at like a curator, he thought about the way the audience would engage with these things. And I remember we were so um, distraught at the thought of, you know, just sticking them on the wall because we're like, well, then they're going to have to be destroyed when we take them down and they're not going to be in the study collection with them. And Richard, <laughs> Richard said, no problem. I'll just make you another print because he, he was just, he's like the opposite of fussy or fanatical. It was always like, what was the most practical, you know, how do you lean into what uh, digital technologies meant? And he, he understood that sort of without fear or trepidation. So, I, there was, um, I have one question. First of all, Lois, there was a question that came in in the chat about where people could buy the book that you held up. Don't, don't tempt us without telling us where, where we can buy it. Would you uh, tell us? A foundation um, um, published it. So okay. So on the Penumbra website. Yeah. Penumbra. Maybe right here, we'll put that, we'll put that in the chat so that people can uh, go to Penumbra and get it. It, it is, it's a, it's a marvelous thing. Um, so one of, so if, if, you know, if there are other questions other than that, please put them in. I, I had a question for you both, Sarah and Lois, um, which draws a little bit on the, one of the last exhibitions I did at MoMA, Dorothea Lang, Words and Pictures, where Lang said, all photographs, not only those that are so-called documentary, can be fortified by words. And although I never had a chance to talk about this relationship between words and pictures with Richard, I was wondering how that experience of bringing your words about, true, about your experience with Richard, but how the experience of writing about your photographs and seeing them alongside that uh, may have inflected your thinking around those pictures that you included in the book. So, you know, did, you, because artists are, I mean, I personally, I think the Lang quote, all photographs can be fortified by words. I, I don't think I actually agree. And I also find it a very curious statement for somebody who dedicated their life to making images to kind of privilege words like that. So I didn't, I didn't know Lois or Sarah, if you, if you had any thoughts about words and pictures and. I'd, I'd much rather make a photograph than, than write <laughs> right about the photograph um you know it's it's it, you know it's like it's very difficult for me to write I mean I'm happy I'm really happy with what Sarah pulled out I mean it was surprised that I wrote that um you know it's because I'm not a good editor of my own work I'm a really good editor of other people's work but um I mean words I'm really good at editing words but not my own it's um but I I think you know, there's, I always read the wall labels, but this, this exhibition that Sarah put together really was different because, um, you know, the pictures were amazing. And then, you know, what they said about um, their connection to Richard, it just, you could feel it without reading the words, but the reading of the words made it more you know, more live, more, I don't know. Fortified. Yeah, it fortified it. But it, it, I don't know, they they added to it and, and, and then you can step away from the photograph and the words stay with you as well as the image. I don't know, but yeah, I think, you know, I, there's a lot of good writing about photography. I mean, you know, I like writing and um and words so sarah yeah sorry <laughs> no i was just gonna say um even though we kind of created the structure of this uh you know call for collaborators of an image and some text that somehow <clears throat> that the text talked about something that you learned and that the photograph didn't necessarily have to it just had to be an image right and so I probably was one of the last uh, people to submit because I struggled so bad with trying to find an image that somehow could replicate or show my influence or what I learned, which isn't 
isn't visual. You know, it, it can't be translated. The way you think about something can't necessarily be translated. So um, I just, I, I didn't give up, but I, get, I let go of it. And I was like, the image is one thing, the text is another thing. And when they're put together, they might resonate differently, right? Just like any picture next to another picture will make you see both of them differently, but they don't have to be a mirror because they're not the same and they never will be. Um, so I don't know what that means, but I was, I was like, why did I ask people, why did we ask people to do something that I can't even do myself? But once I let go of the constraint, um, it was easy. Yeah, I think I think uh, Richard did that for all of us, and I think uh, you know Leslie Martin and the team at Aperture and all of the contributors really gave of themselves in the book. And yeah. Miko, I think you came up with such a a great design that allowed uh, you know all of those different relationships to pictures and words uh, to happen. So. Um, I just also would like to say, in addition to Newport, Rhode Island, where we've had some very special visitors tuning in from, we have today internationally Sao Paulo and Argentina and Anguilla and several cities in New Jersey and New York and Pen Pennsylvania and Maine. And so it's really, in Quebec, um, it's really nice to see the breadth of interest in the audience and you know, if I think we, Leslie Martin has taught me to say that if, if photographs connect us with the world and aperture inspires, uh, inspire, you know, hopes to connect us with photography, I think Richard also has built a community around um, how to help people connect with images and photographs as objects and as ideas. And um, thank you all for bringing that to life today uh, for us. So we really, um, appreciate it. Uh, did, I didn't know if uh, Arnica, if you wanted to say have the last word, or if you're happy to let I that. I thought it was amazing, okay. and I know our um, guest also thought the same. We learned so much about Richard Benson and his influences on so many. Thank you all for your presentation and all that attended this this um, APAT talk. We'll see you at the fair. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Arnica. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.